from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report this Easter weekend. I'm Tyne Morgan, and here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. From several feet of snow to astonishing tornado damage in the south and Midwest, more wild weather sweeping the country this week. You can manage a lot of things, but you can't manage the weather. Even with the wild weather, farmers in eastern Iowa could be just days away from hitting the fields as they're preparing to plant. A blooming business. And then uh, one day Wendy was reading through a magazine and saw a tulip farm up in Virginia, and she says, that sounds like a great idea. From a dream to reality, it's the picture-perfect setting this Easter weekend. Baseball season is in full swing, and that means so is the fan favorite food, peanuts. Hampton Farms is actually part of Severn Peanut Company, and Severn Peanut Company has been in operations since 1947. The journey from the farm fields all the way to the baseball field this weekend. Well, now for the news. The big story this week, the wild weather. We start off in Missouri, where a tornado tore through a rural area of Bollinger County, causing widespread destruction and killing or injuring several people. Crews forced to use chainsaws to cut back trees and brush to reach homes. The tornado was part of a powerful weather system that pushed through the Midwest and South midweek. Well, not rain, but heavy snow in the plains. Check out snowy South Dakota, where Highway Patrol reports the semi slid off the road near New Effingham and I-29 due to the inability to see the road. The snow up to the steps on the semi. Troopers reported high winds on top of heavy snow, and that caused poor road conditions. And in Casper, Wyoming, meteorologists say the area received 26.7 inches of snow on Monday. That's an all time daily snowfall record for any day of the year. And all that snow will hopefully soon start to melt. And that's good news and bad news for the West. A survey this week found California's snowpack is one of the largest on record. In fact, the snowpack is three or more times greater than normal in some areas of the Sierra Nevada. Surveyors putting the statewide water equivalent at just over 61 inches or 237% of average. The size of the snowpack will help inform how the state manages its water supply over the next year. But despite a wet winter, states including California will still have to make cuts to their Colorado River water usage. Even though we have this extraordinary snowpack, um, we know that uh, the droughts are getting deeper and more frequent. Um, and that means we have to use water efficiently no matter what our hydrologic conditions. Officials say the size and distribution of this year's snowpack is also posing severe flood risk to areas of the state, especially the southern San Joaquin Valley. And this says USDA releases its first crop progress report of the season. Right now it reports 2% of the corn crop is planted. That's on par with the five-year average. As for cotton, that's 4% planted, just one percentage point behind average. The big story, though, winter wheat conditions, with 36% of the crop overall rated poor to very poor. Just 28% is good to excellent Kansas. It's hit the hardest, with 57% of the crop rated poor to very poor. Another grain exporter says it will no longer export grain from Russia. Louis Dreyfus says it will cease those exports on July 1st. The company is saying in a news release it's a result of increasing grain export challenges. It says it's also assessing its options for transferring its existing Russian business and grain assets to new owners. It joins Cargill and other companies which announced similar measures last week. Oil prices surging at the start of the week after OPEC announced it would cut production by more than a million barrels per day. The cuts will begin in May and last until at least the end of the year. The White House said the move was ill-advised, but a spokesperson noted the price of gas is down more than $1.50 since last summer's peak. Now some analysts say we could see $100 per barrel prices again in the future. Well, it's happening again. A semi-trailer carrying thousands of dollars of beef appears 
to have been stolen. Police in Grand Island, Nebraska say a load of beef worth $275,000 was reported stolen from the JBS plant in the city. One news report in the area says a driver of subcontracted trucking company picked up the shipment on March 20th. The meat was supposed to be delivered to Salem, Virginia, but it never arrived. Police say the truck and trailer stopped transmitting a GPS location. You'll remember last year we told you about a string of 45 thefts of meat that resulted in over $9 million in losses. In October, investigators arrested three Miami men on suspicion of transporting stolen goods and money laundering. All right, that's it for the news. Well, could a major warm up finally be on the way, especially those of you who are still buried in snow this weekend. We'll have a check of the weather coming up next. U.S. Farm Report is sponsored by Germinator Closing Wheels. Germinator Steel Closing Wheels, perfected in conventional, excels in no-till. Order 12 to 16 rows today and qualify for free shipping or 20% off an end zone moisture management package. U.S. Farm Report Farm Country Forecast is brought to you by Calhoun Superstructure, engineered fabric buildings serving the agriculture and fertilizer industries for over 30 years. Visit calhounsuperstructure.com slash AG. That's calhounsuperstructure.com slash AG. Time now for a check of weather. Andrew Whitmire joining us this weekend. Andrew, this week definitely did not look like spring. Some of our viewers getting three feet of snow, but is a major warm up on the way. And yes, Tyne, uh, this map really does uh, scream a spring across much of the lower 48 outside of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we're going to be really looking at above average temperatures increasing here across much of the country. In fact, we're going to be looking at 80s, 70s and 60s spreading their way northward, and that'll help melt again some of that snow that we picked up across the Dakotas and upper Midwest earlier on in the week as they're going to get temperatures back well above uh, freezing. In fact, some 40s and 50s, maybe even a stray 60 for them later on this week. Temperatures next week, we're going to continue that above average outlook here for much of the East Coast. I'll step out of the way so you can the take on in the reds that'll be showing up here across uh, much of the eastern half here of the country. And again, this is going to increase allergies as well as more budding out on the trees and outside of the deep south. We're going to see those trees really budding on out here across the northern states here as we go throughout to the mid portion here of April, but still looking at below average high temperatures at times as we go throughout mid April here up along the Pacific Northwest. Let's take a look at our jet stream here. As we go throughout this week, we are going to see a massive ridge likely trying to build all the way up across southern Canada. And again, that's going to allow this warmer air from the south to just feed up northward here. Meanwhile, we'll be watching a little bit of a dip of a trough there into the jet stream, and that's going to keep things a little bit wetter as well as cooler up along the western coastlines here of the U.S. as we go throughout this week. Check out our snowfall map here. Outside of a few snowflakes up across the Intermountain West, that's going to be about it for much of the country here. Not much snowfall to talk about uh, as we go throughout this week of April and even on into the mid-month of April as well, which I'm sure for those of you, especially across the far northern states, are finally saying, yes, spring is almost here. Let's walk you through the precipitation map. Over the course of this week here, we're going to be watching some of the Gulf Coast states as well as Florida for a few heavier pockets of thunderstorms that will likely develop. Meanwhile, much of the country is staying quiet in the Pacific Northwest. It is your rainy season, so we're going to continue to see again in and off of showers uh, developing up along the western coastline. Looking at the drought monitor for this uh, week here and we again continue to highlight the southern in central plain states that are dry and again we still need lots of moisture for the western half of Kansas as well as northwestern Oklahoma. Unfortunately, this does not look to be our week here before this added moisture here across uh, the plain states. Let's take a look at our precipitation for this week. We'll be seeing a chance for maybe a spotty shower or two out across the plain states, otherwise looking dry for the Tennessee and Ohio River Valley all the way along the east coast. Time Thanks, Andrew. Well, the market's shifting part of its focus to weather. Dan Bossy and Chip Nellinger join me next to talk about the market action and the main drivers.
Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Chip Nelliger and Dan Bossy joining us. Chip, seeing our first planting progress report out from USDA this week. We'll talk about the wheat conditions in that later. But 2% planted on pace uh, with, with, with normal. I mean, it's not a big market mover right now, but what is the market focused on? Yeah, you know, I think weather is uh, something the market's focused on right now. It's a little bit early to be talking up planting delays, but uh, certainly uh, the Dakotas in Minnesota uh, with a big, uh, you know, spring blizzard this week are in the uh, crosshairs. Can they get the crop planted that they intend to up in that area? And uh, in spite of being on track as far as the uh, planting progress goes, uh, that south, the mid-south delta area uh, is behind in general. Their window uh, as far as beating the heat is is uh you know a little bit uh smaller so they've got some catching up to do um you know and some rain on tap so uh i think right now the market has digested the 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 stocks and acreage report they're looking ahead to the weather and this is typically a time of year where it's a uh, you know a little bit uh, uh cloudy and murky as far as what the uh, the outlook is so you could see some sloppy choppy trading here as the market tries to digest this forecast ahead of us yeah, Dan, besides weather, we knew after this 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 acreage report and grain stocks that the trade would kind of focus on, on weather and shift that focus. What else right now is, is moving the markets? Well, international is still moving the market, Ty. And I think, you know, as you look at the Russians, we had multinationals, almost all of them. Uh, I don't want to say get kicked out of Russia, but they left Russia unwillingly uh, uh, with some strong elbows to the middle rib. And so, you know, as you as you think about that, uh, the Russians are taking control of the grain industry, much like they did their petroleum. This is going to diminish transparency in Russian grain trade. I think you're going to see more, uh, let's say, country to country transactions. I think the FOB market becomes a little less uh, uh, becomes a little more opaque. And then, uh, you know, if I can move your attention away from Russia down to Brazil, you still have the Brazilian farmers who are now about 80 percent harvested on their soybean crop. But Paraguay has got a dollar 80 discount to the U.S. Gulf, and that's giving the market some uh, soybean market some pause as it tries to push its head above 15 dollars for extended periods of time. Yeah. And you look at some of that lack of transparency. I mean, Chip, does that concern you longer term, similar to what we're, we're seeing, you know, when it comes to China? Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I think uh, it seems like uh, Russia has taken a page out of the uh, Chinese playbook as far as the transparency goes. And, and you know, rightfully so. They've always played it close to the vest. Um, you know, it's hard to get actual numbers out of there. Are they going to export? Are they going to ban exports? Are they going to, you know, create some sort of domestic uh, stockpile? They're playing that game and we don't know for sure what, uh, uh, you know, what the end result will be. But uh, to Dan's point earlier, you know, I think the Kansas City market has taken note of the weather in the plains. The Chicago market is where most of the fund and money flow comes in, and they haven't quite cared yet about the Russian situation or this weather in the plains. They've got a big short position on. All you need is to keep this weather uh, on the dry side uh, well into April and the first half of May. And I think that uh, you've got the spark for a nice rally potentially in this wheat market. Dan, you just had a conversation with some some traders over in Europe. You know, what did you what did you learn? What is the long tail that maybe we're not talking about right now that this this war in Ukraine could create specifically for the commodity markets? Well, you know, I met with a lot of Russian, Ukrainian, Baltic traders. Uh, we had big meetings and we all talked about uh, the risks and the opportunities of the markets. Uh, you know, the, the, the Ukrainians are struggling mightily, as you can imagine. Uh, they, they can't find fertilizer. Seed supplies are several years old. The price of diesel is now up to $34 a gallon. Imagine farming with that. And so, you know, numbers will be coming down. I think actually this year's Ukrainian crop export program will be well below last year. And then if you think about what the Russians just did in taking care of the control of the grain industry, that's fine in terms of buying from the farmer and elevating it on boat. But it's the Russian farmer that will be the big loser. We still believe he'll be able to get some technology from Syngenta and maybe Bayer and some others on the seed side. But longer term, I think there's going to be a drag in production out of the Black Sea in general, including Russia and Ukraine. And that's where I worry about. And so down the road, there seems to be a tailwind, a bullish tailwind, if you will, what we don't know about today, though, is will uh, President Putin uh, actually allow the grain corridor to continue after the middle of May that uh, he gave us a 60 day extension? The Russian grain traders were more pessimistic on this. We'll see how that all comes forward. But that would be really important as we head into the end of April and middle of May. 
All right. Well, when you look at some of the, the demand and some of the numbers that we got out this week, there were some some positive signs out of those demand numbers. We'll talk about that. We need to talk about cattle, hogs. We'll cover it all coming up still on U.S. Farm Report. Please stay with us. Got equipment to sell privately but tired of scams and hassles? Visit MachineRepeat.com and click Sell Mine. MachineRepeat.com, the simple and secure way to buy and sell equipment online. It's Easter weekend, which means that Christians are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But there may be an alarming trend when it comes to Christianity. Here's John Phipps. I stumbled onto a study from the Public Religion Research Institute about religious practice in the U.S. It triggered several helpful analyses by experts which were all struck by, the, by one particular trend, the sharp decline in white Americans identifying as evangelical Christians. I should note that this study separates out non-white religious data into their own categories. Christians of color are represented here in greenish shades, for example. But this is the graph that caught the most attention. The decline in white Americans identifying as evangelical Christians is sharper and more complicated than I had thought. The leveling out in the last decade of mainline church affiliation is equally surprising to me. I suspected that the success of megachurches was a big factor, but they account for only about 10% of all Protestants and have been growing more slowly recently as well. Since they are largely evangelical, that suggest, or suggests that their success could be members shifting from smaller evangelical congregations rather than adding the unaffiliated. Deeper in this meticulous and impressively large survey was this result. The religiously unaffiliated, sometimes ironically called the nuns, are not only growing and apparently absorbing most of the decline in other categories, but the trend is persistent. The groups of columns are 10 years apart, and the cohorts, that's the age groups, are 20 years apart, so we can kind of make some rough comparisons. For example, the 10% of unaffiliated 18 to 29 year olds in 1986 aged into the 17% of 30 to 49 year olds by 2006, and the 20% of 50 to 65s in 80, 2022. The cohorts and survey intervals don't exactly match, but they're close. This holds true for other cohorts as well. One inference is growing older does not make it more likely for people to become churchgoers. In fact, it looks less likely. A contributing factor is megachurches don't stress membership as much as attendance, although it seems to me those who attend those churches would likely respond as identifying as. Nor is this decline due to immigration, since immigrants are slightly more likely to be religiously affiliated. I have no grand conclusions to draw from this other than, like Europe before us, the U.S. is becoming less religious, especially among white Christians. Well, I'm sure many of you do have some thoughts on that. You can email john at mailbag at usfarmreport.com. When we come back, we're heading just down the road to Lawrence, Kansas for a classic John Deere 40. Machine repeat, he has tractor tails coming up. Hey, welcome back to Tractor Tales, folks. This week, we are Kansas bound. We're gonna go check out a John Deere 40. I bought this tractor out of Newton, Kansas. About 18 years ago, and this is my first restoration, and it, it was done 15 years ago. And I use it a lot for blading snow and hauling wood, and I've had it at plow days a couple of times. And it seems to run, run real well and does what I need it to do. I wanted a John Deere, and I wanted a small John Deere, and I wanted a three-point hitch. And this was John Deere's first three-point hitch. It was on the Model 40, and the old M's that this replaced had, a, had their own hitch and nothing else fitted except that equipment. This tractor was completely disassembled. Uh, there was, I'd never seen a tractor wore out as bad as this was. A lot of things got fixed or replaced or whatever it took. and. Uh, it helped that I worked in a machine shop at the time and I had access to a lot of 
equipment that I can repair a lot of the parts with myself. I've got a an M front end under it. The 40 front end I had was, was wore out beyond repair. And I put an M front end under it, which is basically the same. There's a few little differences, but uh, not enough, nothing you can see until you have, have the radiator off and everything, you can see a couple of changes. They, they bend up a little stronger for the 40 years. The sheet metal was straight and pretty much all there, and uh, it did run. And well, it's been snowy and it's been cold in parts of eastern Iowa, but farmers actually say next week they may get in the field to plant. So what you need to know as you prepare to plant and hit the fields, that's our Farm Journal report next. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Trusted, timely, tradition. Prepare for planting. A U.S. Farm Report special series is brought to you exclusively by Bayer and Extend Flex. Well, this week reminded all of us Mother Nature is in full control when it comes to planting prep and progress. USDA says 2% of the nation's corn crop is planted, which is right on track with average. But as another winter storm blasted the upper Midwest, this planting season is still weeks away, creating some weather worries for some. And managing Mother Nature's curveballs is exactly what we're doing this weekend as we help you prepare to plant. 12th, 15th of April, we'd like to be in the field going. Iowa farmer Brad Dodds dodged some of the severe weather that hit this week. The anticipation's always there. We want to get going so we can get it in the ground. And that means planters could start to roll here as early as next week. We get better yields if we can get in there early. The window to plant is a nice switch for Dodds, who says March was chilly and wet. You can manage a lot of things, but you can't manage the weather. From drought in western Iowa to saturated soils in the eastern part of the state, Iowa farmers are seeing it all. I'm finding that a lot of conversations I'm having with farmers are that it's actually drier than they thought it would be coming out of such a wet winter uh, as we seem to have. We had a lot of snowpack and it seemed like we had a lot of freeze and thaw cycles. And that means Dodds isn't alone in thinking planting could be just days away. In a lot of cases, I've got farmers that are already thinking about starting their herbicide applications because we are hoping to be planting next week with the forecast that we've got here in Iowa. Anderson says even if planting is pushed back due to rain, weed control needs to come first. I know it's so tempting to, you know, if we get delayed, we need to get out there and get everything planted. And if we can get out there with a herbicide pass before the, the crop is up, that's probably okay, but in a lot of cases, we still need to be thinking about that timeline and making sure those weeds are taken care of first. Check out these pictures a farmer captured last year. The first half of his field saw a pre-emergence, but then he was rained out. And so as you can see, the half that didn't get that early application of herbicide is one that turned into a nightmare for weed control. The goal in my mind is that those pre-emergent products are really setting us up for the best possible growing season that we can have regardless of what the weather is that comes after that. Dodds says they spray as early as possible on their farm. And things have changed immense in the last, I would say, five to ten years where you, you did wait. Now with a lot more pre-emergence options, we do go out early. Another change is Dodds' decision on what to plant first. The big thing is, you know, we've changed how we plant. It used to be wait on soybeans and do your corn first. Now we're doing both at the same time. We found out quite a bit of a yield advantage to planting your soybeans early, so we need to be getting a pre-emergence down. He says changes to their chemical program were also spurred by another change on their farm. We do minimum tillage. We stale seed bed our soybeans, strip till our corn, so it does offer a different set you have to do for weed control when you're doing that when you're not doing spring tillage. Minimal till creates more time to prep fields, and Dodd says that's been huge, especially considering tillage isn't a tool that they want to fall back on now. It used to be where you just if you didn't get it with the chemical, you take out a cultivator and take care of it. Well, with our changing tillage practices and management practices, we don't have that option anymore. So we have to, we've had to change our whole approach to, to weed management. His biggest weed problem is water hemp. And Anderson says Dodds is not alone. 90% of cases, it seems like across the state, we're targeting a weed that will not be up for probably, you know, 
four to six weeks starting to germinate and won't finish germinating until probably the end of June. And so we've got a really long window that we're trying to capture water hemp and, and make these passes as effective as possible. Anderson says in order to be effective with weed control, it's imperative that you do as much as you can up front. The rate thing is what trips a lot of people up because they assume if they're using the full rate on the product label, that that's as much product as they can use for an individual active ingredient, which is not necessarily the case. While some farmers are battling too much moisture, others are still staring at dry fields, just not as dire as last year. We do occasionally get into cases where things really are kind of devastatingly dry, right? We've just got incredibly dry conditions and we can incorporate most herbicide products into the soil. If somebody's got like a, a harrow or a rotary hoe or even maybe a field cultivator and get those in there so that when we do get the rain, they're going to be more in that root zone. From doing their own spraying to getting better at scouting and identifying problems in their fields, he's learned to control what he can in order to weather any storm. And as you prepare for planting, you can find more of those stories on agweb.com. All right, we need to take a quick break, but there was some positive demand news this week. So what could that mean for commodity prices? We'll talk to Chip Nellinger and Dan Bossy next. Welcome back, Chip Nellinger and Dan Bossy rejoining us. On the show last week, Chip, we were talking about, you know, with, with the latest grain stocks report, the acreage situation, just, you know, China, how there's a lot of, of, of room and potential for, for corn prices if China keeps buying. But at the same time, if they don't, what happens there? We've seen strong demand with, with, with soybeans, Chip. So when you look at just the demand that keeps coming in, how could that change this stock situation? Yeah, well, you know, we've, we've seen from that uh, stocks report that, uh, you know, it came in on the low side of expectations. So any extra demand going forward just keeps it that much tighter. You know, China's been a big buyer of U.S. corn here recently. Uh, we've been selling beans, which has kind of been uh, an interesting, uh, uh, you know, point uh, for me. Typically this time of year when we have these big discounts in the Brazilian bean market, our exports on beans go to zero or negative with net cancellations. We're not seeing that. So, you know, there's still this reshuffling of, of, of the demand and, and the supply situation because of the drought in Argentina. And I think the market is kind of on its toes, wondering how that's going to play out over the next several months. So it certainly keeps, uh, you know, the uncertainty high. The demand that we've seen has been uh, really good, in my opinion. Then the, the question remains, I mean, how much more is China going to buy? And I know that's anyone's guess right now, but as you're talking to traders all over the world, as you're looking at the grain supply situation, you know, what, what do you think? Well, I think, as Chip mentioned, I think the reason China is buying U.S. beans, and I think we had another sale this week, is that, uh, generally speaking, they are buying beans for their reserve. They're still trying to restock the reserve. There's a security issue in China that goes, is ongoing. So they can't take Brazilian beans because they don't store long enough. There's too high of an oil content. So they wash out of Argentina. They're buying the U.S. What I'm watching carefully is this Argentinian bean crop that's coming in is a very low quality uh, chlorophyll is being found in some of the soy oil because of green beans that never matured. So uh, I think aflatoxin is going to be a problem in their corn crop. So with that in mind, uh, traders are talking about maybe a better export profile for U.S. corn and soybeans than what we had dialed in before. But I also worry with the HRW wheat crop under considerable stress in the plains that there could be more corn feeding demand and that these basis levels really stay strong as we look towards that June-July time frame. Yeah, and USDA's report, I mean, this week just showed that those crop conditions are, are just horrible in some of those areas. But you look at some of those areas, Chip, that's also where we have a large part of our cattle herd. We know we've seen liquidation. Is it cash cattle that is continuing to drive these cattle prices right now? Yeah, certainly the cash trade is uh, is really driving us here. Uh, I think the liquidation is done. I, I mean, we've had two plus years of the drought. Uh, you know, the herd liquidation has, has, uh, is behind us, I think. Uh, there's not much left. The only question now is, can we heal some of these uh, pastures and rangelands up, which we have partially in the northern plains, and start restocking some of those herds that were, have been liquidated? And that just tightens the supply up, uh, you know, even more. So uh, the numbers are there. It takes a while to sift through the cattle cycle, obviously, months to years. Uh, I think we're at the end of the liquidation. And now you're seeing that reflected in the cash market being so strong. Well, Dan, you know, some of our viewers may be enjoying an Easter ham this weekend. 
But you look at these hog prices, and that is the other end of, of the spectrum, just some, some ugly price action there. You know, what is causing so much pressure on, on hog prices? Well, it's a little bit what's causing pressure on all these markets, which is economic uncertainty. When we had the banking crisis, you saw a lot of funds move to the sidelines, and those funds have now exited to a large degree, whether it's an index fund or a more of a traditional managed fund, they've gotten out. And so as we look at the market, it's relatively clean. Some of that getting out, of course, was due to the hog market. We saw a big waterfall decline. Cash markets fell along with it. But I do believe that we're about ready to find our sea legs and probably can start trading to the upside from a seasonal perspective. So this is no time to panic in the hog market. Enjoy your cheap uh, Easter ham. Uh, but I do believe prices for ham, bacon, and a lot of other things will be strengthening as we look towards the end of the summer. All right. Thank you both for joining us this Easter weekend. We really appreciate it. All right. Let's take a quick break and then picture perfect tulips in North Carolina. Andrew McRae, we travel the countryside with him next. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Brandt, technology driven nutrition that feeds your crop. Well, agritourism is a field that continues to grow in popularity as producers try to diversify while also finding new revenue streams. And for one farm in North Carolina, business is blooming. We're traveling the countryside this Easter weekend with Andrew McRae. This farm has been in the family for about a century now. While the crops have changed over the years, today it's thousands of tulips that brings people here every spring. Art Johnson's farm has been in the family about a century now. My grandfather, Ash Johnson, uh, purchased the property in 1925 and moved from the other side of Kernersville to here. It was about 86 acres. Uh, it was a basic tobacco farm. Art didn't grow up on the farm, but was nearby and always loved coming here to hunt and fish and perhaps someday make it a place he could call home. That dream came true in his adult years when he was able to acquire some of the farm acreage and build a home. He married his wife, Wendy, and they hosted weddings on their property. And then uh, one day, Wendy was reading through a magazine and saw a tulip farm up in Virginia, and she says, that sounds like a great idea. Art wasn't against the idea, but... I thought, you know, it'd be cool, but how much work is that? Tulips became the goal for the farm, but there was another crop to be planted first, sunflowers. That you pick business went well, so next up at Dewberry Farm were tulips. 42,000 bulbs the first year, 50,000 the next. It took about 12 days with 12 people to plant them all. They invested in a planter the next year, which still requires labor but increases the pace. They plant new bulbs by Thanksgiving every year to ensure the best and most beautiful crop. Today they plant over 100,000 bulbs they get from Holland. You need a premium bulb, a mature bulb, that's been grown and cared for properly. And so we're wanting that one bloom per bulb. And so we get about a 98% bloom ratio. They may have up to 1,000 people per day visit the farm on weekends. They use a timed ticket system to ensure not too many people show up at one time and everyone gets to enjoy the farm and the tulips. They also have you pick sunflowers in the summer. Art's dad will turn 99 this year. He is amazed that so many people come to this place he's known for almost a century. But as time goes on and he sees how consistent we are with the number of people we get in here and how well we do with the crops, uh, he's just amazed. He wishes his parents could see what we've done with a old poor tobacco farm. We raised tobacco here till I was 20 years old. And I think my son really hit on a good thing. The tulip season lasts about three weeks each spring at Dewberry Farm, bringing people of all ages to this family operation growing a crop that delights those who visit. Traveling the countryside in Kernersville, North Carolina, I'm Andrew McRae. Wow, that is beautiful. I'm gonna add that to my bucket list. Thank you, Andrew. Well, is so-called green energy truly green? That's customer support, next. What does being green mean? Last weekend on the show, a viewer had a question about the waste created from decommissioning green energy projects like wind and solar. But is green energy truly green? That's customer support this weekend. It's not easy being green. One question keeps coming to mind when everyone keeps talking about green energy such as solar and wind. 
What is the true cost of manufacturing these green energies, byproducts and waste? Are they truly green? I'm all for the idea, I just wish that it would explain it better. That's from Wayne Lindsmeyer in Auburndale, Wisconsin. This is a great question where we can clear up some confusion about what being green means. The term green is not a scientific term and it's not tied to some specific standard. Basically, it refers to greenhouse gas GHG emissions, most importantly carbon dioxide. The fewer GHG emissions, the greener the technology. There are no absolutely emission-free energy sources, but there is a wide range that would give us perspective. To compare energy emissions, we used an analysis called life cycle assessment shown here. Beginning with the raw materials of extraction like coal, uranium, iron, lithium, or limestone, all the emissions from those activities are calculated. The same for emissions from manufacturing, transportation, actual operating emissions, and disposal. These are the emission sources critics of wind and solar often cite. Life cycle assessment studies, of which there have been hundreds, show how solar construction material, mining emissions, for example, are real but minuscule in terms of electricity generated. Here's how the generation technologies rank using identical methodology. The units are in grams of CO2 per unit of electricity generated. Those at the top are the greenest, they have the lowest emissions. Note it does not compare cost. Cost is not the point for greenness, so to speak. I will compare those in another time. Again, these are life cycle totals from blueprints for a plant back to bare dirt after decommissioning. The disposal exception is hydro since dams are deemed permanent. The most common solar technologies are highlighted and represent most of the installations. For fossil fuels, CCS refers to carbon capture and storage, but out of 224 coal plants and 3,400 gas generators in the U.S., there are fewer than 10 employing some form of CCS. It would make a whacking difference in emissions. Even with CCS, however, combustion emissions keep their lifetime emissions from coming anywhere close to wind, solar, and surprisingly nuclear. Solar and wind aren't perfectly green, but when all the life cycle emissions are totaled, they are as green as we can achieve now. Thanks, John. Well, if you've ever been to a professional baseball game and enjoyed a bag of peanuts, they came from one North Carolina farm. We take you to those fields next. Major League Baseball season is now in full swing, and that means stadiums full of adoring fans looking for traditional baseball fare. That includes peanuts. But where do those fan favorites come from? Well, Clinton Griffiths follows the journey from the farm fields all the way to the baseball fields this weekend. Those MLB stadium peanuts start right here at Donnie Lassiter's farm in North Carolina. While ball players are prepping for the season at spring training, the Lassiters are getting ready for the growing season. So at this point in March, we're making plans on, we're still not doing much field activities, but we're, we're getting a plan together, a crop plan together. Um, we are actually out doing a, a little bit of fertilizing um, and prepping the farmland for peanuts. North Carolina has seen peanut production increase in recent years, growing 510 million pounds in 2022. But the biggest producer by far is Georgia, accounting for more than 50% of all U.S. peanut production and nearly 3 billion pounds. Now, once the crop is mature... Usually it dries overnight. You put them on the dryer that afternoon, 7, 8 o'clock. Usually by 7, 8 o'clock the next morning, they're dry enough. You can deliver them to the market. The market is here at Hampton Farms. In 1989, we got into the in-shell processing business where we started doing the salted in the shell peanuts like we distributed all the ballparks across the U.S. today. You really want a good size peanut and they really want to try to get a bright shell so it looks attractive in the bag. You know, the, the color of the shell really doesn't determine the kernel inside, but it just makes a more presentable product when you're selling it in the shell. Hampton Farms' relationship with the MLB started back in the mid-90s. And that has grown to now we have 20-some different teams in stadiums all over the United States. And um, 
our relationship with Major League Baseball has blossomed as the sport has grown and we are now moving millions of pounds through Major League Baseball, which greatly helps support our farmers here in the U.S. A partnership built on teamwork from field to field. When they grow peanuts for Hampton Farms, and they're not only partnering with people like Severn Peanut Company and Hampton Farms, that they are proud to have to know that their peanuts end up in Major League Baseball parks across the United States. And from baseball, revisiting basketball, congratulations to the winners of our Case IH Bracket Busters Challenge on AgWeb. Jared Turner of Norwich, Kansas came in third, Michelle Lee of Bluff City, Tennessee in second, and Gary Herndon of Ruffin, South Carolina took first place. He walked away with bragging rights, of course, and $1,000. And after this year's tournament, that's impressive. By the way, I just want to mention that I did come in 800th place. That may seem really bad, but Clinton, he came in 1,269th place. I'm not competitive or anything, but just ending on that note. All right, well, that's all the time that we have this weekend for U.S. Farm Report. I hope all of you enjoy this Easter weekend with your families. Thank you so much for joining us. And be sure to tune in again next week as we work to build on our tradition. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.